So here we are again on the Big Steve Backstage Pass. Lucky people that have found me today because you're going to hear a story that is really going to be a lot of fun. You see, in The Grateful Dead, there were two major guitar players. One was Jerry and one was Bobby. And, you know, I was lucky enough to work with both of them. And when... I first came around, I was living at Weir's at Rucka Rucka Ranch, where he had a bunkhouse on the barn where Jackson and Sonny Hurd and myself lived up there. Sometimes Johnny Hagen, Ramrod stayed out there once in a while. And everybody, wherever we'd be, would be the center point where everybody would show up. In other words, we either hung out all together at Rucka Rucka Ranch the band and the crew, or we were rehearsing somewhere at a, at a rehearsal hall in San Francisco or somewhere around Marin County, West Marin Lions Club. We rehearsed there for a while till we finally started getting our own studios and renting them when things got prosperous enough to do that. And so I want to play a little something for you guys right now that sets the tone of this time. So... Roll that for me, Jeremy, please. Now, I want to tell you something else, that if something happened in the Grateful Dead, when we were roadie in there and we had to fix Jerry's guitar, Bobby's guitar, anything in the PA or whatever, and you got to go out in front of 50,000 people, you better know what you're doing and you better do it quick and you better fucking get right to it. And the best thing we could get high on all day was a psychedelic thing in my hand right here, cannabis. Because you could function and you could focus and you could get out there. And thank goodness for that because it got us through some tough days also. It's a great stress reliever. Thank you all. And so you'll see that marijuana was our thing. You know, it, it was always burning, always smelling whenever we set up, whenever we loaded in. Now, actually, Bobby, he kind of, uh, he quit smoking around 1969. He, he, he kind of took a little bit of time off because he was getting high a lot in those days. And uh, everybody in the Grateful Dead had a tolerant attitude. So you could come in and, and be drunk if you wanted to, but it didn't work for really doing the job. And you could be on anything nobody would come down on you now here you see uh, that's kid helping me on bobby's gear and it was like bobby's gear was sort of like whoever was done first with their other job would set bobby's stuff up but then i started doing it full-time regular and being his his full roadie in that way and uh he was just a lot of fun to work with he never played the same gear setup two times in a row it changed something every show just about, but always to the better, always constantly thinking about it and, and having us get some new front end or new gizmo or gadget box. He was always trying to really hard trying to work. He was really hard work and dedicated to his sound and always was. And uh, there's another picture here of me and him out there and I'm back there behind him. You see, he was playing wireless at this time too, because he started wanting to jump around on stage, Bobby, and, and be active. He, he, people were criticizing the Grateful Dead for being too static. And so I took two long curly cords. We never used curly cords, but except in the very early days before, you know, when, when you buy them at the store, when we start making our own cables. But I took two curly cables and spliced them together, and Bobby was jumping around the stage and, and trying to jump up on the PA stack and things like that. So he was the first one to go wireless. You can see the wireless antenna is uh, right where I'm working. And uh, you had to get over to Bobby's stuff as quick as you could because he would start kicking his rack if it didn't come on and that was the worst thing because then everything would fall apart in there he just rear back and give it a kick and then it meant going through every cable and making sure some everything was plugged in 
Now, another worst thing was when Jerry and Bobby both had a problem at the same time. And that was really, yeah, this, this shows uh, the stage with both of them playing. And so when they both had a problem with their guitar, that was the hardest thing. And I remember a couple of times that happening, and it always seemed like I was working on Jerry's stuff first, and then Bobby would start yelling. And good thing that, you know, there was a couple of others of us that could help him and cover him. Ramrod would jump in and cover, or Kid, and we kept an eye on the stage that way. But, you know, a lot of times with either one of them, if there'd be something and they'd be screaming when they got out there, and if you saw what it was that they just forgot to turn a toggle switch from tuner to main gain or had done something really simple, you never pointed it out because they get mad if you did. Uh, I would say something like, uh, you don't want to say, Bobby, you forgot to turn your preamp on and you'd hit the button and it would come on, you know, and he was getting frustrated. But you never said that because uh, they didn't want to hear that. You uh, see they had an amazing mastery of what was going on with their equipment. And so it was beautiful to work for both those guys. They both had a great style and knew what they wanted sound wise. Bobby had a hard thing to come up with something that sounded different than Jerry. And uh, the good thing about working with Weir is he always had this great fun attitude and Jerry too. And so the three of us became a really tight little unit in the heart of everything because we just had so much fun together, the three of us joking around and goofing about stuff and would always be uh, something that you could rely on Bobby for. At the drop of a hat, he'd pick up on a routine with me. We had a couple of routines and we would pull them on people. When we met some strangers sometimes, you know, we'd say, oh, yeah, we met in an orphanage here or there and when we were kids and oh they'd love these stories we'd come up with really funny ones and uh it was always a goof time bobby was the guy who carried a water pistol with him carried a cap gun and that would get us in trouble on airplanes <laughs> even before there was all the security stuff he would come up to you while you were talking to a stewardess or the 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 check-in lady at the desk and start squirting you right in the ear with a water gun and it didn't make you very much seem like you knew what you were talking about when you were trying to say that we do have tickets, ma'am. And there are 15 of us. We're getting on the plane right now. You know, and they would like, Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see. We have something like that. But you know, the decorum that Bobby showed was kind of goofy. He would say stuff when the security line started, he'd be the first one to make some jokes about it. And uh, we got in trouble for that sometimes too. He did not uh, accept authority just, without questioning it all the time. And, you know, uh, one time I remember we were in a hotel in New York and we we were having a pretty good party in the crew suite. We had a little suite of our own, me and Jackson and uh, Winslow. And everybody was in our room. We had a couple of tanks of nitrous going. We were having a heck of a good party. And Bobby was in there running crazy with us. And we ordered some food from one of the New York delis, you know, and they came and a guy knocked on the door and I opened the door and, and he was, this, this man was carrying two giant bags of food. And I could see Bobby behind me out of the corner of my eye through this side mirror that was there. He picked up a pillow off the couch and he reared back and he was going to throw it at me and hit me in my head while I'm talking to this guy. But I saw it coming and I ducked down. I dropped down and hit the guy right in the balls. And Bobby couldn't apologize enough to this old man. It really hurt him and it, it kind of dropped all the food and it was a big scene. But Bobby, sometimes, you know, he, he was always such a great gentleman. He, he would bend when he met somebody, when he met a lady, he would bow to her. And he always kept a gentlemanly uh, air about him that was really a lot of fun. And he really was respectful of people. Now here he is with his big sidekick in the seventies. And that's his dog, Otis right there. Otis was a Norwegian boo hund and Bobby just loved this dog. And we all did. And they went together everywhere. Bobby had a 63 
or 62 a Corvette that he kept just like it was, man, the day he found it in LA. And and it, he, he was always gonna like do it upright, but it was a it was a beautiful uh car. And Otis and him would come in with the top down and pull up to Front Street to our studio, and Otis would be sitting there next to him, and you could tell usually we were waiting for them because Bobby was usually the last person to show up, but he was also the last one to show up for airplanes and things like that, but he'd always make them. He never missed them, but we'd be there getting on, trying to stall the people. And he'd come running down that hallway. You know, he was pretty fast runner and he liked to come in the last minute. He would never want to get up too early. He tried to get up just so he could get the most sleep in or whatever, and then come barreling to the plane. Um, now Otis was like his, was the strangest connection they had this Otis I don't care what anybody tells me he understood English and he would come there to the studio and the rehearsal would be going on for hours the guys would be learning new stuff they'd be in the back and Otis would be hanging out with us in the crew room up front or in our little uh, land somewhere on the cold concrete in the studio or in the on the side where we stored the gear but when he was ready to go he would get up and go out in the studio and he'd walk up to Weir and start pulling on his pant leg or nudging on him to say, and everybody would say, oh, I guess this rehearsal's over now. Otis actually called when Grateful Dead rehearsals ended and sometimes when they started too. But we would get food delivered a lot of times or go out and get food for the rehearsal and we'd put it on the desk. You couldn't leave Otis out there for a second. He would knock it over and get into everything. And that's one dog right there that would eat all the hot sauce of Mexican food. He loved the hottest hot sauce there was, which was I thought was really strange. Now, we sometimes would be just sitting around up front, and Otis would be out there, and Bobby would do this thing. We had a jar of peanut butter in our little refrigerator there, and Bobby would stick his finger in it, and he'd say, come here, Otis. And he'd stick his finger up in Otis's mouth and stick the peanut butter on the roof of his mouth. And Otis would just go like, start walking backwards and trying to use his paws to get that peanut butter off his top palate. It was just hilarious to watch him do that. But he would just start backing up. And Bobby thought it was the funniest thing. You know, it wasn't uh, anything but a a funny little joke for a minute because Otis always used his tongue to get it down off there. But the way he went after it, it was so comical. And hey, it, you know, I always hate to interrupt, Steve, but I do have a question. You said that you thought that the dog spoke English. You have to give some context to that, please. Well, what I'm telling you, you when I just told you, there's no reason for you to say that because when I just told you how he would may come in there, he somehow understood the whole timing of everything. He would call the rehearsal sessions. He would want to go when he knew it was time to go. And so whether or not he actually could speak, he understood everything that was happening around him, you know, and, and he was a high level dog. He could actually read your mind. Okay. And, uh, I've just seen many dog master teams, but this was a special one right here. And Otis knew all of us real well too. And he knew everything that that he could get away with, with you. If you were eating a burger, he knew he could get a bite off it or something. If you, he he would stick around the people who he thought were soft touch for food, you know, like any dog, but he was a master at it. And he seemed to speak English. I say, because of the way that he carried himself and, but he certain people like if a young lady came in, he would look her over for Bobby or, or for us or anything. And he had a way of sniffing people when they came into the studio to visit us. And he seemed like he was our concierge in a way, you know, that's what I was trying to say right there. So is uh, now this is a pass from a show that we did at one time. Uh, you know, Jerry had a very successful band with the Jerry Garcia band Next was Bobby and his uh, side bands that he would try. So for a while, he opened up for the Jerry Garcia band uh, in the 80s, and that was him and Rob Wasserman, and they would come out and do a duet. Uh, Bobby playing acoustic electric and Wasserman playing a stand-up doghouse bass. And 
they opened for us a couple of times at the Wiltern Theater and the Warfield. We just loved going on the road with Bobby because he was so much fun. And there would be the natural thing of three of us, Jerry, me and him together. And so in a lot of ways, we were forming a, a, a friendship that lasted for so many years. It was so cool to see everything grow and change and have a, a ringside seat to it with these guys and to be involved in it every day. And, you know, here's Bobby goofing on stage to Jerry, putting the whim wham on him over something. And I kind of almost remember that moment because uh, it was on a tour in the summer, but Bobby just had that way of making a lot of hand gestures. He used to have me get all kinds of whistles and horns and things that he'd have with him because he when his thing was to try to get the attention of the band sometimes and get him to pay attention to him when he was changing song or ready to go into another song. So he would blow a whistle sometimes out there. He would have all these, uh, he was real good on the, uh, in, in the Uptown, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Band. He played the jug. And so he, he loved all, penny whistles and all these little um, whore, um, sirens and stuff. He could blow on stage, get everybody's attention. It never really worked. And sometimes the guys would even laugh at him, but uh, he always wanted to get their attention when it was time to move into a new song, you know, because sometimes they get lost in space and they would often, of course, be able to communicate and come in together and, and always locked in. Now, Jerry was famous for saying uh, about Bobby that he loved playing with Bobby because he, Bobby played stuff that he never dreamt of. Jerry said he was the greatest rhythm guitar player because he played stuff that nobody else in the world did is what he said, because Bobby would get in challenge sometimes in, the, in those days, you know, and people would uh, question this, what, what was we're doing in there and here, but Jerry loved that. And it was always a surprise to him. And Bobby was such a great sport and really a, a hard study. He, both those guys were always had their guitars, man. And those were the greatest times. They just were, were every time you were with them, they were strapped on with the guitar and ready to pr keep practicing, playing. Bobby would call it woodshedding. Jerry said, working on my chops. But they just played all day long and everywhere at home. And sometimes, you know, Weir would wake up in the middle of the night and want his guitar because he would just play when it came to him at that three o'clock you know it's funny how you everybody wakes up at three o'clock in the morning they say that's a special hour when the veil's thin and i've seen it many times that people would communicate with each other in the hotels sometimes we'd all be stacked in these hotels and we'd have the same dreams we'd come in and talk about our dreams and very often we dreamt the same thing or very similar things you know uh, a lot of times we played in a couple of places where the hotel was attached to the gig. And that was the weirdest stuff. It, we found it much better to get away from one or the other because strange psychic things would start happening. And Bobby was always up for that. And he was great fun at the party. He was one fun boy, man. I'll tell you that. And he ran the party room just perfectly because, uh, his, his name on the road was Hugo Fukusev, or you go fuck yourself, actually, but he pronounced it Fukusev. And so he would check in with that name. But that was the party room, the Hugo Fukusev. And everybody had these other names on the road. Brett was Bud Weiser. Uh, I don't remember Jerry ever really having any. Uh, Surprisingly enough, he would people would call him and he'd talk to him. Um, and this here's a shot of us joking on stage, the three of us. Some something that we threw out right there was amusing us. And I just love that picture because it captures that sprightly feeling that we had of being at work, being serious, taking care of business constantly, but always ready for a joke or a prank, or you had to pay attention. All that kept you paying attention that way. Because if you messed up, you got told. And that was one thing you learned with the Grateful Dead. If you did make a mistake, you better say it, what you did, because we had to get to it right away. 
So when you were learning, plugging in stuff and plugging in PA, you'd make a mistake sometimes. And that could be really, you know, disastrous. You'd plug the high horns into the low feed and all this stuff. It would cause problems. But you were taught to own up to it quick so we could get to the bottom of it. And that was something that Ramrod and I always kept together. Bobby loved sports. Uh, he still does to this day. He was just a sportsman. He plays every sport. And he loved when we played baseball. He was so into the baseball thing. We didn't quit playing baseball until he and Bill Graham at a game uh, when we were playing Bill Graham's uh, BGP people. The, uh, he, they, Bobby was running. He hit a, a pop-up. And Bill was on first base playing first base. And Bobby was running for first base. And they were both looking up in the air. And they collided. And both their shoulders popped out. And that was the last uh, baseball game we ever played, actually, as a team. And um, then Bobby was into uh, the Tamil Pius Chiefs, and he had a little uh, touch, rough touch football team, and he was the quarterback. And he loved – we used to play football in Winterland after shows when we were really young and against Bill Graham's guys, and – it got pretty intense. Bobby always was quarterback for us, and we had some amazing games in there. We wouldn't even start until everybody was gone. It was like 2 o'clock or 3 in the morning. We'd have these intense games there, man. That was a lot of fun. And uh, we always seemed to win, but it was because we had a, we had a great team spirit, and we would – we knew how to psych out the other team. You know, they would get scared of us because we would get so crazy. It, it worked. But here you see Bobby with the great Steph Curry as he loves basketball and he goes to games often. And the Warriors have always been friends of ours going way back. We were buddies with them back in the early, early 70s when CJ was on the team. and uh, They would always come to our shows and we'd go to their games and that friendship has remained very strong all these years. They're a great team, and, and they always had a lot of fun with us. The here's Here we are in Europe, and before we left New York for Europe, uh, I went to a joke shop and bought all these bozo heads, and these, uh, these are Groucho Mark glasses right there. And so at the gig in... Copenhagen the guys put them on and all were playing them on stage and there's Bobby in his uh, Groucho Marx look he was always ready for fun and always will be uh, ready for a joke on anybody and loves that stuff looks like he's wearing a Groucho mustache too doesn't it yes and so you could always rely on Weir to be goofing with you with anything he loved it and he would prank you too if you didn't pay attention when you were rooming with him, you had to stay on top of it. You you had he he would be in, you know, if you roomed with him, he would do some pretty crazy stuff at the party. And and the party would usually be wherever he was. So he he and I, I remember a couple of times that when we used to stay at the Continental Hyatt House on Sunset Boulevard, which became the Riot House, you know it from uh, almost felt famous. It was the craziest hotel ever. You walked in the door in the lobby, and it was a party. Second you walked in there, the lobby was full of rock and rollers from England and Australia and Europe and America. And everybody just, the party began as soon as you walked in. Before you checked in, you had a party, an entourage of people following you up to your room. And and we usually had a whole floor in there and just had the greatest fun in that place and bobby would would always do the craziest pranks like for instance he I remember one time i was talking on the phone he knocked on my door i opened the door and he threw in a mat of firecrackers and pulled it closed because he heard me saying to the person oh it's pretty quiet down here no we're not up too much it's just a day off here in la and boom he throws this mat of crackers in and then he jumped on the door from the outside put his feet on the wall and pulled it closed. So I'm sitting in there trying not to give him the benefit of the doubt that the room is building up with this acrid smoke from the firecrackers, the, the whole mat going off, which is over 250 firecrackers. And in those days, they were powerful ones. 
my room filled up with so much smoke, I had to take a chair and smash the window out. It wouldn't open just to get some air. And so he would take a prank to the farthest limit. <laughs> Sometimes it got a little hairy. But uh, yeah, you did. Uh, he was he was he was a serious partier, but also a great friend and such a great person. You know, I look around my house and I'm going to put a whole show about it sometime and show every he would go out and get me a personal Christmas gift every Christmas and some amazing stuff. I mean, from all his travels around the world, if he went to Bali, he'd bring me a mask back. If he was in China, he brought me a food dog that was, you know, ancient. His parents were really interesting and they, they collected um, Asian art and other things. And he knew all about that stuff. And he took us on some great, trips with him uh a very interesting person mr weir is and worldly in every sense of the word and just a really solid down-to-earth great friend to to this day he has helped me so much and he still does you know we work on things together because we have sacred uh history of going through all this stuff and uh you couldn't ask for somebody to have your back as much as that guy. He's right there for you. And um, I just really felt so honored to work with him. Uh, do we have any other slides now or do we go through them all here? We, we went through them all, Steve. Uh, okay. But great tribute Here's to Bobby. Great tribute to Bobby. Well, he's we deserve it of it. And uh, I can't say enough good stuff about him. There's going to be a lot more about his guitars, about his, his uh, philosophies. Uh, he, these are just introductions of the characters, you know, and we will keep doing this on this show. And love having you guys tune in. I like this so much, being able to talk about all these things and to show you pictures and